created in the image of God, a series that examines the role of religion in society, from messianic returns to the emotive responses transmitted through our culture. Wade fearlessly addresses reality claims from all directions, objectively exploring their compatibility with Holy Scripture. Joining him is Daniel Sanderson, CEO of Planksip, an international philosophy and cultural media outlet, helping emerging thought leaders with personal branding by co-creating organic content. Tonight's episode, Heaven and Hell, An Unsettled Theology, with John Christie. Welcome, John. We, uh, you're, you're gracing the, um, the virtual pages of our show uh, at our 70th show. I don't know if it's a, if, if it's a significant number, but I'm, I'm just noticing that it's really, um, the numbers are adding up quickly. Um, and we're at the point where we're definitely not recycling guests, but this is, this is John's second appearance on the show. And um, it's great to have you back, John. Thank you. It's great to be back. Looking right forward. on, right and on. 70 might not sound like the milestone of 100 or something, but 70 is pretty good. Yeah, yeah. So we're getting into the finesse of this. And I want to explain to, um, to, to the audience that the, the idea is to get into things quickly. I think this is something that is ubiquitous with podcasts everywhere. It's get into it right away because people have um they have a limited amount of time to either beam into what we're talking about um or to move on to something else um tonight's show is an exciting one because we are going to be talking about heaven and hell um wade is going to wade's got a lot of experience uh on the theological concepts related to heaven and hell so i'm going to be really excited to to sit back in the backstage and listen to that. Uh, what I'd like to talk to you about, John, is let's bring up uh, the audience up to speed with who John Christie is, and um, specifically, let's refresh the audience's uh, recollection about John Christie. Where do you where did you come from? What were you um, like as a as as a young lad? That's where I'd like to start. A young boy, the young boy, John Christie. Uh, sure. Um, so for the most part, you know, I had this as a young boy, and, I, and I'm assuming as much as I can say relating to something in the religious realm uh, for the sake of the podcast. But, you know, as a kid, I grew up with this desire um, to be right with God, I think is the best way to say it. It was, you know, I wanted to not just know God, but I wanted God's favor, approval. Um, and I and I think that may have came from partly my upbringing with my own father, who um, was, for the most part, either absent or abusive when he wasn't uh, when he wasn't present. It was kind of my favorite time. And uh, I kind of felt like in that, you know, I was really um wanting that father figure, wanting that God figure. And we did not grow up religious. We grew up partly Roman Catholic, partly Greek Orthodox. So we went to uh, mass on holidays, if that. And um, and so as a kid, as a young lad, as you put it, you know, I, I uh, was into, into sports. I had friends. I was into music. I, you know, had all the typical young kid um, ambitions, desires, you know, girls, uh, but I always was seeking, you know, I could feel it as a, as a young child. And I'm talking like seven, eight years old um, and aware that things that I would do were just wrong and bad, not necessarily like, you know, just the stealing of the bubble gum, but the thoughts I would have, the, the anger, the, the feelings, and just this feeling of inside of me, you know, there was this rebellion. And again, you know, I didn't have the greatest father. He went to prison when I was uh, nine years old, going on 10. Um, he was, again, absent, or when he was around, it was not good. So I definitely was seeking. I was looking for wow. something. And I knew specifically what it was as far as God. I mean, I remember talking to my mom about that and saying, you know, I'd like to go to church. And I started attending at a young age with some friends uh, or a friend of mine and his family looking back now it was probably you know a charismatic type of uh, non-denominational church 
Um, but at the time I didn't know it was just, you know, we had a Sunday school and then church service and, and it was God, it was something about God and I enjoyed it. And, um, and then I started going to mass with my aunts on like Saturday evenings. And, and I just, when I was learning about God, when I was talking about God, it was just resonating with me. And, um, Mm. And I don't know if I'm going into too far now, but no, that's, that's you really asked the good. question, and, but <laughs> and it's 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 a bit of a challenge because I'm 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 a good listener, and when somebody's you know when somebody's so uh, emotionally connected, it's I don't want to interrupt. There's a I mean you were that's that's um that's very courageous to go that deep that quick um, with something that's so dear to your heart. A couple of the things that came to mind is that when you were explaining this to your mom. Was she supportive in that journey? Uh, did she participate in, in in going to church with you? Um, how did how did she kind of compensate for that as a as a single parent? Um, she was supportive. Um, as far as going, she you know she worked at one time. I think she was working four jobs, so she wasn't around. Um, she was always and this is over weekends and everything. She was always working going one job to the next. So that's why I would go with a friend or my aunts or, you know, someone that, that I could go with. Um, but she never, you know, discouraged me. She just didn't know what we were. She, she didn't know how to deliver what I was looking for. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it was foreign to her too. Again, she grew up in Roman Catholicism. So she was very um, aware of God, but it just wasn't a part of our life on a day-to-day basis. So, um, she ended up taking a job and at that company she worked at, there were a few born again Christians, the owner of the company, you know, one of the senior sales reps, people like that. And we ended up having some people over for dinner. Um, he was one of, I think he was a sales rep or vice president, something like that as vice president of sales. And he basically, you know, looking back now, I see it as it was a planned evangel- evangelism meeting. I don't know if my mom knew that. I don't know how the dinner invitation went out, but you know, he came with his wife and me and my, uh, I think my, at least one of my brothers were there and my mom. And I think my aunt who I was going to church with, um, and he basically just presented the gospel and it was very Mm -hmm. simplistic. And I remember sitting, you know, on the ground in front of him as a little kid, just listening and hearing about sin and forgiveness through Jesus Christ and salvation and all these things that I just, I thought, that's it. That's, that's that thing I've been looking for. It's Mm -hmm. that forgiveness, you know, that, that unity with God, that knowing that God loves me, that I'm all right, that I, that it's not because of the sins that I'm doing, but it's because of his grace, because of the work that he's done, that I can be forgiven. And, uh, and I was all in. I just, I remember, um, you know, when he brought it to the altar call or, you know, said, if you want to receive Jesus, let's pray. And I was like, absolutely. I want to do this. And, uh, and I've described this plenty of times as the way it felt like to me was that something was coming off of me. It was being lifted. And I was sitting like with my legs crossed on the floor, but I felt like it started like at my toes and it just peeled off of me all the way up through my torso, my head, and just gone. And I think to me, that was the weight, the burden of, as Paul puts it, the old man. And I think it was taken off of me and I was made a new creature in Christ that night. Without Mm -hmm. a doubt, I changed. And immediately people had started noticing it and saying it. And I was about uh, 12 at the time. Um, But friends, young friends would tell me, I'm not as mad as I was. People would say, you know, you're very different. You have a different countenance. You have a different look about yourself. Um, I was, again, I was, I had a lot of anger. I had a lot of um, frustration, disappointment. You know, nine years old, my father goes to prison, you know, all these things through through the course of time that had just built up inside of me. And, uh, and this changed it all. You know, it didn't make everything better. You know, it didn't restore a relationship with my father, for example, but it changed me. It changed who mm-hmm. I was inside. Wow, that's uh, that's really fascinating. Would you could you describe a little bit um, this 
this, sh- I mean, you've described the transition, but yeah. explain to me the, you know, the, the day-to-day being, the day-to-day experience of moving from um, like the before John Christie to the after John Christie, the searching John Christie to the I'm almost arrived sort of, because um, you're still it. in an <laughs> adolescence, right? Like yeah, you're still, absolutely. you're still a young boy, right? So explain to any, and you've had this like reflection of, from your social peers or your family that say, hey, John, you look, you know, there's something different about you. Did you cut your hair? You walk differently, you smile differently, you have a certain different energy. So describe how that manifested in in daily activity with your relationships and just your, your general presence. Yeah, I think it's a typical story from the standpoint of, you know, the first thing I did was uh, telling everyone about it. You know, all my friends at school, now all of a sudden I became this Christian kid that was telling everybody about Jesus and what he'd done. And, and, you know, at 12 years old, it's hard for kids to, in a sense, grasp the weight of their sin. You know, there's not a lot of kids, especially the kids I had grown up with. They, again, they kind of lived regular kid lives. You know, most of them that I can remember had two parents at home. They played sports. They were interested in girls. They listened to music. They did all those things. And I think they had more that sense of that's great for you, but you know, I haven't done anything that bad, you know, that type of feeling where for me it was like, no, but you don't understand. This isn't like, I'm trying to, I'm not trying to go backwards and read into it as much, but I do think that I had this sense, this strong sense inside of me of what original sin was, you know, that we're born into it. And that was, just what resonated with me so much was the feeling of I went from feeling as if um, I was doing wrong to an understanding that I was wrong, like Mm -hmm. to my core, like my, I needed salvation. I didn't just need someone to teach me how to act better. I don't, I I hope that's Mm kind of, making sense but that's the feeling that I had as a little kid and so in my day-to-day life I think that was the first thing was you know I became um the evangelist you know I I talked to all my friends about it I uh we had a little bible study with uh some friends I remember I think it was eighth grade and a girl's mom started teaching us and you know we kind of congregated because I was speaking out and doing that and then even as I got to high school um you know, I was kind of known as the, one of the, the more Christian kids. Um, and it, it, you know, I was never, I don't want to sound like I was this perfect kid that did no wrong. Cause I did plenty of wrong things still, but, um, but I was always seen by my peers or by my close friends, especially as kind of that set apart Christian kid. You know, I would have friends that would say, um, I don't, I don't want you to come to this party because you don't belong there. You're not that type of kid or something like that, you know? Mm. And then I had my own struggles with that as I got older and, but either way, um, you know, so I guess, I guess that's kind of the effect it had at a young age. Yeah. 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 Well, we're going to, we're going to transition to the, we're going to transition to the first transition of the show, which is (laughs) we're going to give, we're going to we're going to play an advertisement for a book and in typical fashion we usually play your 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 trailer John for your book but that has yet to be written so that's a hard one to make a video for so we've got another author's book uh, Ken Tingley last american editor we're going to be um, we're going to be giving away one of his books towards the end of the show Wade's going Wade I think maybe with your help a little bit too John you can weigh in we're going to we're going to give away a book um, to to that person that uh, engages in the comment. So uh, this is the point in the show where we are encouraging everybody to put put their comments into into the chat, um, and that can be questions for John, that can be questions for Wade. Um, just you, you know, put put your questions in, put your comments, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. It's it's, it's what makes the show. Quite honestly, um, John, I want to 
Uh, I know we're going to be heading towards the the theme of the show, which is uh, heaven and hell and the theology that encompasses all of it. But I tell you what, there was one thing that that jumped into my mind, and it's probably a little bit of a diversion from 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 the show, but not really. And here here's where it is: is that we have a um, um, more of an institutional projection of 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 sin without the words sin that that, that I see. So um, uh, generational guilt about the actions of our forefathers. You're an American. I'm Canadian, so I'll focus on the American tradition. So things that the American forefathers did um, are projected on and through the institutions um, as basically presupposing guilt upon generations. And as you were explaining that, um, uh, this, this, this underpinning of sin that exists, it's, it's manifesting in a way that is, is not tied to religion. Are, are, do you see what I'm describing in, in an abstract sense, John? Do you see that the, the institutions are are doing it not from a, a religious um, standpoint, but more of a, an educational uh, academic standpoint? I think so. I, I think the difference would be that what I'm describing is a blanketed of humanity sharing the same level of what I, what I had mentioned as original sin, yeah. where I think what you're referring more to segregates and says, um, you know, there's white crimes that we lump the white Caucasians together with. There's Asian that we lump the Asian with and, and we go throughout and we, you know, do it with the different, um, tribes in a sense mm. throughout history and, l and lump the sins together with them as if anyone is any better or any worse than, than the others. Mm. And the thing I see, you know, this is, this is the depravity of man. This is why, um, this is why I don't buy into humanism. While I love the ideal of humanism, I don't trust the humans in it, and I don't think we have any evidence over the last five thousand years of recorded human history to make us believe that we can get it right where others have failed so many times. And I think that's because of the depravity of man, the uh, that original sin that we all share, and it manifests in different ways. Um, but ultimately well, that, it's all the same. You know, that's perfect. I mean, I could feel you, um, like intellectually and spiritually, um, I was going to say bristle, but you're not in, opposed to it, but you're inspired, right? You're inspired. Yeah. And I think it's, it's a perfect time to, again, go to commercial break. I hope I've set you up well, Wade, with that. I know it was a little bit of a risk to go into that in a little bit more depth, but I felt that that was, um, the thing to do. Um, so when we come back from commercial break, you're going to have Wade um, delving into this in much in a much deeper uh, fashion uh, with John. So hold on, and uh, we'll be right back. Sounds good. John, it's so good to see you again. Hey, Wade. And uh, for those who are wanting to sit silently and not provide their comments to get a copy of that book, there's the QR code. You can just pull out your phone, your device, scan that QR code. It'll take you right to the uh, Amazon page, I believe, where you can order The Last American Editor by Ken Tingley, who is the uh, former editor of a Pulitzer Prize winning newspaper. And these, uh, this is the first of three volumes published by Something or Other Publishing, which details the stories that he uh, reviewed while he was in that role. So um, 
I want to thank Dan for teeing this all up. Thank you for returning back, John. There were, were indeed a number of items, I think, of great interest that were being discussed there in the opening, um, opening minutes of the show. I think maybe we should just start with this concept of original sin, because we'll get into heaven and hell much deeper later, and you have you have some thoughts on that that are maybe a little bit unorthodox. I'm I'm not really sure where modern orthodoxy lies on the subject of heaven and hell. The title of the show is an unsettled theology, and we jokingly talked about it being an unsettling theology. The idea that God would mercilessly punish people throughout all eternity in the, the fires of hell. Um, but this idea of original sin, I guess, might be one reason why if uh, people didn't repent at some point in their life, you talked about that moment where you felt the burden fall off and where you realized not only that, that you uh, had done wrong, but that you were wrong, you mentioned. So unpack that a little bit for me um, in terms of your theology and your personal experiences around the original sin, repentance, and um, what might happen to people if they don't repent. Yeah, so I guess to define a little more um, about the, instead of doing wrong, I felt that I was wrong. What I mean by that is sin, as we see it throughout the Bible, and I think throughout, again, human history, throughout mankind, and when we examine it in ourselves and just in the world, it always comes down to the same um, initial premise, which is self. It's self selfishness. It's pleasing myself over anyone else. And that's why we do things um, ultimately to, to gain, to harm, to succeed, to whatever it may be, as we gratify ourself. And so that original sin that we have is, you know, Eve standing before the tree and saying, it looks good. And she wants to touch it. And the serpent knew that. And all he had to do was coerce her, but she was there. She wanted what she knew she shouldn't have. And that's a gratification of self. She wanted to please herself over anything else. And so when I say that it's not so much that I was doing wrong, but that I was wrong or that I realized, you know, wrong was me in a sense, it's saying that um, I knew that inside of me, there was a gratification for my desires, whether it was revenge or anything. And, um, and so in, in kind of seeing that, I felt like, as I've grown and as I've learned and as I've come to know the word original sin, um, that this is in a sense, the, the problem we have with humanity is the reason we can't fix things is because we're always looking for ourselves over others. And there are moments in time when we set aside our own desires for others, but then we're right back at it. And it's a daily occurrence because it's who we are inside of ourselves. And, it makes perfect sense if you believe that God created us with a free will and we have an awareness of that will, we're going to want to use that will for our own purposes over anyone else. And this is why, you know, Christ teaches that what you must do is lay down your will, die, give up yourself for him, for his will. And that's the ultimate. That's the that's the born again experience. That's the salvation is the surrendering of my will. It's no longer my will be done, but thy will be done. And that's the, the place I was at when I was a kid sitting on the floor. It wasn't the magical words that I said, the prayer that it was done, the incantation or anything of that sort. It was the understanding and the release of my will to God to say, I'm yours. Um, your will be done, not my will be done. And that's what took off the old man because the old man wanted his will done. And the new man said, despite wanting it, I'm going to live my life by another code. And that code again is thy, thy will of my master. And um, 
And it's not that, you know, from then on, I've always done that. And I've been, it's a, it's a struggle. It's a wrestle. I still deal with it. I'm still here and I'm in this body and I still have these earthly desires to, to do my will. And I often do, but I know that I'm safe and secure in the fact that I've been forgiven for my sins, for my trespasses, for my rebellion toward God, and that I'm being sanctified day by day by his spirit to be more like Christ, which is ultimately the most self-giving of his own will for that of the fathers. Somehow I ended up on mute there. there. I really appreciate you unpacking that, and I think you did an excellent job. It actually describes a lot of the theology that I grew up with. And during the time when I was a minister, Mm -hmm. um, I had described it in very similar terms, not exactly. And um, I've spent the the years since I resigned from the full-time ministry in which I was separating my faith from my paycheck so that I could more fully and completely explore the truth, not um, coerced, manipulated, or led by physical needs, uh, i.e., you know, my paycheck, right? Or to conform, but rather to fully and freely search the scriptures and come to really my own conclusions. Um, not as a, a loner, but in consultation with others, but completely free and unencumbered and able then to adopt the beliefs that that seemed most right. Um, and of course, there is that there are scriptures like there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Uh, Jeremiah 17, verse nine, the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things who can know it. And I'm sure you're familiar with some of these scriptures and some of these scriptures are reinforcing the beliefs that you've just shared. Yeah. Having said all that, some of the bathwater that I threw out while trying to retain the baby is in fact the belief in an original sin. And let me just unpack an alternate view. Mm -hmm. So, and then we can discuss that. So let's, let's go back to Genesis. Um, I'll quibble with a couple of minor things. You mentioned that the serpent coerced Eve. I don't think he did at all. The serpent could only whisper and influence. Um, And uh, of course, Eve, to your point, was led away by her own desires. She looked at the tree and it was a tree that was desired to make one wise. That word desire comes in there. Um, And then that word plays out again. I think the next time it's used is, is when Cain kills Abel. And it is then said, God then says to Cain, sin lies at the door and it desires you. (laughs) It has a desire for you, but you must rule over it. And um, at that time, Cain Cain isn't told, you know, in that sense to repent and receive forgiveness. He's told to rule over it. And of course, one could say, well, that's because Christ wasn't available yet. He wasn't there yet and all that. I I just read it a little differently. And and now let's look at it from science for a moment. We now understand that we have what I like to call the reptilian brain brain stem. I don't know if it's the the amygdala or, you know, we have have base instincts, as they're often called. Um, And I'm not saying that God works exclusively through evolution, but I do believe God does work through a form of evolution. Um, and I, w- I don't want to get into that or unpack it. I think I think God has set up the universe to function the way he wants. I view him fully as the creator. But there are so many mechanisms in that creation that we understand better today than the ancients could possibly have understood. And the Bible wasn't intended to be a science textbook that um, advanced knowledge that wouldn't be available until 4,000 years later. Um, certainly there is revelation and prophecy that gave glimpses and indications of what was to come. But comprehensive scientific knowledge and concepts that were not available to the early man required God to to limit his revelation to that which could be understood by the people at that time and according to the evolution of humankind and society, if you follow me. So what I'm getting at is that as we look at how we are built as as creatures, 
And David said, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. It is my view that there was not an original sin. There was an original state of communion with God. And it was after Eve took of that fruit and the so-called fall, which I also don't necessarily believe is a good term, the fall of man, humankind, Eve then realized she was naked, right? And, and uh, Adam realized they were naked and they hid from God. So that would be the equivalent of the state of sin. Would you agree with that last statement? I know I put a whole lot in before that, but the state of sin entered in after eating the fruit. On that, we would probably agree. Ish. Because <laughs> I guess what, what I... Because wouldn't, wouldn't I, I that be the original sin. sin? Wouldn't the original sin be the eating of the fruit? It was the first enactment of sin, the or first the act of rebellion. the fruit. Yeah, it was the first act of rebellion, which is what sin is, I guess. Um, yep. The desire, as you pointed out, you know, was there ahead of time. Um, so the the propensity for sin was there before the sin entered the world in a sense. I know Paul uses that phrase and that's kind of the way we see it as sin entered the yeah. world, but it's because that was the first act of rebellion before then the propensity was there. But so in you a might sense, say Jesus he, clarified that when he said, if you, even if you lust after a woman, exactly, you've exactly already committed right. adultery. So he's calling out that the sin was already there before the fruit was actually eaten. That's that right. And, and it's the same thing when he even says, um, that it's not what goes into a man that makes him unclean, but what comes out of a man. And and that's the thing, you know, throughout yep. the Bible is God looks upon the heart right. and it's the heart. So when I see the, uh, say we're born into original sin, that's the way that I see it is we're born into this condition for a propensity for enacting our free will to choose for ourselves. And there's a, and there's a distinction. Yes. I just want to make so, one more point to that. Cause I yep. think we're kind of close in what we're saying, but I think we're closer than we are apart. Because one of the points I that, I, that I make out um, often with people is that I do believe in this, you know, so-called age of accountability of children. And in Deuteronomy, when um, God Amen. says you will not be to Moses and those Israelites, you will not be inheriting the promised land, but your children who did not right. know wrong and right. And they're in a sense, not sinful yet. They will get um, into heaven. Now those children have the propensity towards it, but they're at an age yet well, where that, they're, not a, they're not held accountable for that. Go ahead. This is what I'm getting at. I don't believe we are born in sin. So when we when we say the original sin, what, what, um, what do you mean by born like in the fall sin? In the original sin. Can you Pardon? define born? Can you define what you mean by born in sin? Well, what I mean is that um, Eve and Adam hid from God. Mm -hmm. They realized they were naked because they recognized their sinfulness at that time. And they removed themselves from God. And I think this will, this will play into later some of what you're, I think, going to share on your ideas of heaven and hell and what the definition of heaven and hell are. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, if under ancient Israel and Moses, the children that were not of age, whatever that age was, were allowed to enter into the promised land. So children of a certain age, whatever that age might be, one, two, three, four, five, you, you can't say that they would have committed sin in the same way that Adam and Eve in the initial days in the garden, weren't aware of sin at all and had, had, in that sense, maybe not had occasion to sin. The tree represented the first occasion to sin and then the desire entered in because God told them no, which, by the way, is why many people say the Ten Commandments in, their, in themselves are evil because they're negative, right? They tell you what not to do, which instills that rebellion. One could extrapolate that out to various conditions in the world, which I won't go into right now, where who's to blame for this and that? Um, is it, is it the people who react against the commandment or is it the people who issued the commandment? Um, no, it's the people who don't follow the commandment who are to blame, but, um, but you get my point is that I do. So in that sense, you're not born in sin because 
you're not going to go to hell if there was a hell. Um, no, but you're until born into the you have reached an age of accountability where you could be held accountable for knowledge. Let me give another example to sort of pinpoint this. And this example okay. could be unpacked in a number of different ways. But it's when Paul refers to that tree in the verse where he says, you have need of being taught again. You are still babes and you're still drinking milk and you should be of the age where you could consume strong meat. But strong meat belongs to those who by reason of use have exercised their senses to do what? Discern good and evil. Mm -hmm. Discern good and evil, which is what the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil That's held right. out. In that sense, Eve desired to be wise, right? She desired to be mature. In that sense, she was maybe just precocious, right? And wanting to, you know, pray to God to give me patience right now. And if you ever pray to God to give you patience right now, you better not be serious because he might, he might accelerate the process of you learning patience. And it could be a very, very painful lesson if you follow, if you mm -hmm. catch my drift. So the school of hard knocks is what Eve entered into. But that school is one that Paul says is necessary because by reason of use, we exercise our senses to discern good and evil. This is a process of maturing and growing up and would parallel this discussion we're having about children and whether or not they're held accountable at age one versus age 15. So, and again, yeah, I think we're closer than we are apart on this because if you think with the tree, the tree being there and having the fruit and even Eve's desire for it was not the sin. The sin was that God had made Correct. a command, do not eat of this tree. And if you rebel against that command, you're in disobedience. You are then satisfying your own desires. As I was saying earlier, gratification of self over God's, the, the master, the, the owner of the land over the rule that he put out. That's where the sin is. So the tree in and of itself wasn't sin. And the way I see the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because I have had people say to me, you know, why does God hate knowledge so bad that he would forbid them to, that's, it's not a thing of all of a sudden they had this mystical wisdom and these understandings. I see this as if I told my son before he was going to go out and party and he'd never drank alcohol before. And I said, if you go out and you do this and you drink this excessive amount of alcohol, you will wake up in the morning with this knowledge of hangover this knowledge of <laughs> suffering that you do not have today because you've never had that hangover you've never had that suffering once you experience that there's no going back you now know what a hangover feels like you now know what that suffering is that's the way i understand the knowledge of good and evil before then they didn't know about the difference of what it felt to be in rebellion with god because they hadn't once they rebelled, now they know, they have the knowledge of this is what it feels like to be good on one hand. This is what it feels like to rebel, to be bad, to be evil on another hand. They had an awareness of what was inside of them already. So that's why I would say the original sin, again, is that potential inside of us to exercise our free will, which those young children have not fully done yet. And you could even, I think, make the argument that a really young child that's crying out for its own, you know, mother's milk when it's eight months old, isn't being in rebellion when the mother says, be quiet, stop crying. They're acting out of their need. They're not aware yet. They're not cognitive. They're enough. not, they're not even being selfish because it's everyone would it's agree that it's a basic human right. Right to be to be able to eat right and um but that's then, not a selfish desire but then once they get to a point in life where and, and again right. to your point i don't want to get into the details of when that happens but there is a point where at least according to god he's going to hold us accountable for those decisions that we make for ourselves over over his will and and that's i guess where i'm saying it's not that's why i asked you to define born in sin because some people believe like babies are sinful creatures and and they'll use those expressions you know if you've ever heard a baby cry and what do you want he's being sinful i don't agree with that i think 
babies are born into a a free will life that they have the potential to choose their own way and that's the original sin the potential to choose myself over god's will and once i do that now i'm i've given into sin and and i think that's you know i think in romans 7 paul explains that pretty well and and in the fact that the law the law is for the lawbreakers not for those who obey the law you know so it, for example if if there was a new law tomorrow that said i i no longer have to pay income tax i'm gladly no longer paying my income tax but if there's a new law tomorrow that says murder is no longer illegal i don't think i'm going out murdering anybody so laws that don't have that effect on us because it's not something that's in us that we desire don't really have any any control over us it's the laws for those things which we desire that we're prohibited from and that's how we we're tested and in a sense we sin well we're going to go to a commercial break here and this next comment is part of this discussion it's also a convenient segue into the actual commercial and that is that uh, paul talked about those who are a law unto themselves right mm -hmm. that um those who didn't even know the jewish law that those those evil gentiles right he was actually helping the jews see that some of those gentiles were more righteous than they were mm -hmm. and that they were actually maybe obeying a higher law the law of jesus whereas a lot of the pharisees and sadducees were getting hung up on the points of law or my favorite one of my favorite lines of, of jesus my favorite statements of jesus is that the pharisees washed their hands with a fist because it's so indicative of how they made a show of being obedient to the law but they were actually doing it in opposition yeah. to the people they were like punching the people in their self-righteousness while trying to demonstrate that they were righteous they washed their hands they kept the law with a fist yep. and then paul was saying you know there are these other people that are a natural law unto themselves and god honors that even if they didn't do it out of faith or awareness of Jesus or anything like that. So yeah. um, one of the positions of the show is that it's, it's not a show about Christianity. <clears throat> it's created in the image of God, the role of religion in society generally. And all the religions have similar profound wisdom. The golden rule is extant in all the religions. And um, this next uh, commercial break that we're going to show is, is for a, uh, an application that, puts that at your fingertips. When we come back, we'll di dig in deeper uh, into this topic and we'll trans uh, we'll um, migrate towards how these things tie into the subject of, of heaven and hell. Stay tuned. Discover the world's religious traditions like never before with Ocean 2.0 Reader. Our custom ebook reader is designed for exploration and study with an immersive audio integrated reading experience and powerful research tools available on all platforms including web, Windows, macOS, Linux, Android, and iOS. Experience the benefits of immersive reading by combining ear and eye with improved comprehension and vocabulary acquisition. Our interfaith library features books from various religions, so you can have access to a wealth of knowledge. Try Ocean 2.0 Reader today and elevate your reading experience. And there's that QR code. This is a free download. Use your phone, your device. Go there, punch on it, download. While you're at it, don't forget to subscribe. Share this out with your friends. We're in the studio with John Christie, who uh, has a movie out called My Week in Atheism, I believe. Um, just while we segue back into the main topic, tell our listeners a little bit about that, John. Yeah, well, it goes back filming. It was 10 years ago. We're coming up on the 2024 will be the 10 year release of that movie. So um, it was with a friend of mine, David Smalley, who uh, is a podcast host. And uh, at the time, the show was called The Dogma Debate. Now I believe it's just called David C. Smalley podcast. And uh he was an atheist. Um, we became friends, went on his show once, twice, led to a couple, a couple handfuls. And, and we'd have these side conversations and we'd stay up at night and talk and, you know, the same type of stuff that was on the show. And 
I forget. I think he had mentioned, you know, that you should come down to Texas. At the time I was living in California, he was in Texas and, you know, you should come to Texas and uh, we could hang out and I could take you to some atheist conventions or something, you know? And I was like, you know, that would actually be a really cool movie. Come down, spend time with you. I think um, there was the American atheist convention. We were going to go to that and I'd spend the week with him and we'd film it and make a movie out of it. Well, one week turned into a year, went to, I think, three different conventions. Um, we did a debate slash uh, interaction with students at the University of Texas. Um, and it, you know, it's a, it's a movie more about exposing myself to atheist beliefs than it is about the Christian combating the atheists and the Christian comes out winning and on top saying, you know, atheists are wrong, Christianity's right. It's more about... Um, exposing myself to their beliefs and there's you know back and forth and combating with them um throughout but for the most part it's just that you know that we can have these discussions we can have differing opinions different beliefs different interpretations and not hate each other you know not come back at the at, at the end of it and and feel that the other person is vile and evil and disgusting and and it's you know to that sentiment, it's more appropriate nowadays than it was 10 years ago, because I think we've become more aggressive toward each other about these types of things. If you're a Democrat, your feelings toward a Republican. If you're a Republican, your feelings toward a Democrat, Christian to atheist, and so on and so on. Um, we're becoming more and more divided, and I enjoy a healthy debate. I enjoy differing opinions. I'm always looking to learn more, to grow my mind, but I'm also firm in what I believe, but I'm open to change. And so I will have those discussions. I'll have those conversations. I'll challenge your beliefs. I want to be challenged on my beliefs, but I want to walk away at the end of it with a handshake and a feeling that we understand each other more and we actually like each other more. Um, that's my plug for my week in atheism. It's on Amazon. Uh, you can, if you're prime, you can watch it for free. Otherwise I think it's 99 cents to rent. We'll put a we'll put a link in it here um, towards the end. Um, I'm not going to do it now. I don't want to encourage people to leave this show and go watch that instead. Uh, but towards the end, we'll look at that. So we got a couple of we've had a number of really good comments, but I'm going to just use a couple here um, to re tee this up and and go a little deeper. So Jet uh, 4231 is saying regarding original sin at the time that Adam and Eve had to decide whether or not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they did not have any knowledge of good and evil or right and wrong. And um, I agree with Jet here the, in the narrative, especially when you consider that uh, Adam's first task was to name all the animals, right? And so Adam must, you know, his first education was an awareness of, of some of the different animals and maybe some of their characteristics and traits in this story, right? And um, he examined them all and he also compared them to himself because one of the conclusions that he drew was they all had mates and he didn't, right? But the other thing about animals, and of course, this is a brief story, you know, you, you could unpack it forever. But um, the other thing about animals is they all have some kind of instinct. They all have societal behavior of some kind or another. We were just down in um, Arizona doing a transformational leadership or, or a servant leadership or spiritual leadership program and um, we were working with kids and we did a challenge course in which we had them go through all these stations, starting with the mineral and plant kingdom and then the animal kingdom and learn about the different species and their characteristics. And we learned even rattlesnakes have societal behavior. Even rattlesnakes take care of their babies and, and have friends that they visit and whatnot. Um, so bees, of course, ants, they have highly developed social structures and um, elephants, you know, they all do and dolphins. Dolphins even have names for each other in dolphin language, clicks and whistles. They can recognize their own names and they can call each other and by, by name as individuals. Uh, all these things are coming out as we further study the world around us. Um, my point, though, is that all these animals had instinct. They behave as God intended them to behave. And they're not born in original sin. They're born with the ability calves within minutes are walking around and um, you know, birds inherit the ability to migrate over incredible distances, you know, and there are all kinds of instinctual behaviors. Well, the instinctual behavior of those who are created in God's image 
was to discern good and evil. And Jet was saying they didn't have the opportunity to learn that they were given free will. And just like a human baby is not capable of taking care of itself on its own, it would die. Even at age one, a baby can't take care of itself. Even at age two, a toddler couldn't take care of it. At what, at what age could you drop somebody off and they'd survive, you know what I mean, or have a high chance of survival? It takes us a long time to learn the things we need to learn. So Jet's comment is completely fair, in my opinion. And then he says, so since they had no way of knowing whether they should listen to the serpent or not, how could they be held responsible for making the wrong choice? I agree here, but they were held responsible because of the result, they felt naked. They hid themselves from God. This was the result of their decision. This is what they learned. This is the hangover, to use your analogy from earlier, that they had. So they were held accountable by the natural consequences of having followed this path. Um, what do you... How would you respond to that? This is um, Jet. Yeah, and that's no, why I question comment. the typical understanding of the quote, original sin, unquote. Great comment, but I, I I do disagree with Jet and with you on this from the standpoint of uh, first to address the first quote, you know, they did not have a knowledge of good and evil or right and wrong. I think they had a knowledge of right and wrong but they did not have the understanding of, of the implications of the knowledge of good and evil. I think the story itself explains that, that they had an understanding of right and wrong when Eve has pushback. She says, oh no, we're not supposed to touch this. That right there says, I understand. There's something I should do and something I should not do. Um, it's not a good and evil discussion at this point. It's a right and wrong discussion at this point. And she understands that, I'm not supposed to do this. That would be wrong. I don't. I would agree with you completely on that. By the way, so yeah. Thanks for clarifying so, that. So I think I think there's a difference between good and evil and right and wrong. Now, as far as um, being held responsible for making the wrong choice and dealing with instincts, when we see the lion go after the gazelle and take it down and kill it and eat it, that's instinctual. That's for survival. We don't look at that and say it's wrong. We might not be comfortable with it, but we understand it. We don't look at that and say it's evil. Um, good, I guess, it, you know, it's not good for the gazelle, but it is good for the lion. But that's unfortunately <laughs> the way nature is. Um, but my point being is that's the animal instinct in creatures. Humans are held to a different standard with God. We have an intellect, a superior intellect, and with that intellect comes responsibility. And part of that is an understanding right and wrong, and that will lead to an understanding or a revelation of good and evil. And if we do what's wrong, this is, I think, back to your point of sin waiting for you. I don't see sin as this exterior abstract thing that's waiting out there. I think that's more poetic, but it makes the point of sin is waiting inside of us it's waiting around us. It Again, back to my statement of I, I saw that I was wrong. Um, it's, it's again, to me, that propensity, that, that desire right. to choose my We have a lower nature, and that's the point of, of my citing Cain and Abel. You must rule over it, is what God told Cain. Yes. We have a lower nature, and we must Subdue rule over it. We've been given the capacity to rule over it. We've been given yep. the capacity to discern good and evil. And we've been given the capacity to resist sin and to embrace the good. Mm -hmm. And we're held accountable to that. So there's, there is very little daylight. And one thing I will never do on this show is really argue theology. Um, so Even I'm not really looking <laughs> to discuss the theological implications of sin at this point. Sure. Um, I think, sure. I think we've unpacked this adequately so that any viewer you know, can see some of the different perspectives we've shared without us getting into any kind of argument, which would be negative. So let's move on now. And I'd like to see if I can screen share here um, Ezekiel chapter 18, because this came to mind from some of the discussions earlier. And um, we'll go ahead and um, take a look at this. Uh, this is uh, King James Version in uh, Bible Gateway. 
uh, Ezekiel chapter 18. And this is going to get into Dan's question at, in the opening session as well. Uh, the word of the eternal came to me, and I always use the term eternal for this capital L-O-R-D in the King James Version underlying that is the Y-H-W-H, the I am, I am that I am, God says. So I just out of habit read eternal rather than Lord. It's my whatever, I guess, vain perspective that I have a better way than the King James translators of translating that word, but whatever. Uh, it's just habit. The word of the Lord, the word of the eternal came unto me saying, what do you mean when you use this proverb about the land of Israel saying the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge? As I live, says the Lord God, you shall not have occasion anymore to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine as the soul of the father. So also the soul of the son is mine. The soul that sins, it shall die. And then follow verses describing, you know, if the father commits all these sins, but the son doesn't, um, the son is not going to be held responsible for his father's sins. And um, similarly, if the father was righteous and the son commits all these sins, the father will not necessarily be held responsible for the son's sins. Although I think the father in that sense might have greater responsibility depending on, because elsewhere the fathers are told not to provoke your children to anger. <laughs> And uh, verses like that, you know, child rearing. So um, anyway, then he repeats this in verse 20. The soul that sins, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Um, but if the wicked turn from his sins, he shall surely live. He shall not die. So there are a couple of things here. This is the biblical perspective on this idea of generational sin, right? I don't mm. for a moment buy that we should, you know, carry the guilt from the sins of our fathers um, and take into an extreme. Uh, I believe that's part of the problem we see in the United States today. Um, we should not be held uh, guilty for the sins of our fathers going back many generations. Um but there's something deeper. That's that's my perspective. That's what this verse is clearly saying. Do you agree there, um, John? Yes. Yeah, I think I, I, I agree enough to say yes. <laughs> but the deeper thing here is the um, idea that the soul that sins will die. I think that may be opening up the topic that you're here to talk about, i.e. heaven and hell. Is this one of the verses that you consider as you arrive at your perspective on heaven and hell? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, the problem I have with Old Testament references to these things is they, the New Testament is, to me, ambiguous enough. The Old Testament is extremely ambiguous. And I think, you know, this is a pre pre-revelation of Christ and the resurrection and his authority and the judgment. So it's the old Testament passages tend to be more ambiguous. So I would say um, while I'm aware of a lot of the theology in the old Testament of the soul and death and sin, and um, I, it's an incomplete picture, I guess. So most of my doctrine or my belief on both heaven and hell is more formed from New Testament passages, New Testament um, explanations than it is of Old Testament parts. Didn't mean to skirt around your verse there. Well, no, that's fine. I'll, that's... <laughs> I'll, I'll totally accept that. I'll, I'll at least though unpack the Hebrew word there, nefesh, which means mm -hmm. a living soul, a breathing entity, right? Is the mm -hmm. word that is underlying that translation or into English the nephesh that sins, the living creature that sins shall die. Um, so it's not necessarily speaking of an eternal death or, or the afterlife at all. It is speaking to the primary Jewish understanding that, you know, the penalties come in this life, not in the next life. Yeah. Um, anyway, well, go ahead then. Well, Why don't you... Uh, from there segue into the new testament verses that underlie what you're on... wanting to share yeah so let me let me start with it from this perspective first um i want to be clear about what i'm not 
saying in my perspective, primarily on hell. I don't think anyone's going to have any disagreement with me on my perspective on heaven of eternal life with God. But, um, but what I'm not supporting, what I'm not stating is first and foremost, universalism. Um, I'm not saying that everyone in the end ends up in heaven. We'll just use heaven as the term. Um, I'm not saying that I believe in a, um, in a cleansing of the soul or repentance after death either. Um, I'm not stating either one of those things. What I really kind of am most closely aligned to in a belief is what's called annihilationism. Um, this is, and, and this isn't, you know, earlier you said you weren't sure if my beliefs were orthodox. Let me say this. I know that they're not the popular Christian teachings. These aren't the things that are coming from the popular pulpits, the, the you know, whether it be Joel Osteen or, or El Elevation Church or, you know, most of the more common, um, even, even amongst, you know, the, the most popular books written and things like that. But there's a lot of scholarly academic support for annihilationism. Um, there's some very well-respected scholars in that. And I would say this, um, I very much hold near and dear the belief that, you know, we can disagree on things that are not fundamental, that are not crucial, and still call each other Christians, still call each other brothers. And I see this as one of those things. What I believe happens as a hell and what you believe happens as a hell, we may be at two opposite polar extremes. Um, I don't think that affects our salvation. We'll figure it out someday. We'll know. We'll finally realize which was right, if either one of us is right, or anyone for that matter. Um, so anyway, I just want to make that clear because people tend to read a lot into things when you say you don't really believe in the um, eternal burning and suffering and tormenting of the wicked. Um, so I'm open to changing my mind, but in my understanding of eternity, I see a couple things here first. There's a couple topics to discuss, one being the soul, which you've already mentioned, the other being what is the eternal fire, the other being the second death that's referred to in Revelation at least five or six times, um, and then there's the torment. So when we think about hell, um, the first passage that comes to mind is in Matthew 10, where Jesus says, don't fear the people, don't fear those that can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who destroys both the body and the soul in hell. And hell being that, you know, famous Greek word, Gehenna. And one of the things, you know, that we know about Gehenna was, it was a place where they would have child sacrifices to Molech. Um, it was a place that was prophesied to become the place of punishment by God. Um, whether or not, and I've heard a lot of people make mention that it was the, the continual burning of trash in the New Testament time in the first century. It was kind of the garbage dump that they would burn all the garbage and it always had just this perpetual fire going. Um, the evidence on that, when you really get into it, becomes pretty thin. But what we, but what we do have more evidence for was that again, it was a place that when Jesus mentioned Gehenna, hell, um, people would conjure up this idea of suffering, of torment, of burning. Again, it's where human sacrifices were done, um, and so they understood the concept. So when he says that he can destroy the soul and the body in Gehenna, in hell, what does he mean by that? And we hear a lot about this eternal fire. Um, Matthew 25 talks about it, you know, that there's a place being prepared for the devil and his angels, the place of eternal fire, um, that they'll go away into eternal punishment and the righteous to eternal life. And you've got these two competing ideas of eternal punishment and eternal life. And, and what I think I see more the more I've looked into this, is our concept of what an eternal punishment is, we're reading more into it. And I don't know if it comes from an influence of Dante's Inferno, or uh, specifically if it goes, you know, all the way back to the early church fathers, because many of them did believe in eternal, ongoing, 
punishment, but wherever we get it from, it seems not to be as obvious when you actually go into these scriptures and read them. And the reason why I say that is because to use an analogy, I'll go back to the uh, alcohol drinking analogy in bars again, since this is a good Christian show and, <laughs> and we'll, we're talking about sin. Um, if I'm at the bar and I'm drinking too much and the bartender says, that's enough, you're cut off. That's a punishment. Now I can, you know, create a scene and she might say, okay, you know what? You're kicked out and the bouncer throws me out. That's a severe punishment. But if I'm allowed to come back next week and I've promised to behave, it was only temporary. It was a temporary punishment. It wasn't an eternal punishment. It's also possible that I can be banned from that bar because of my behavior, because I did it a second time and never allowed back again. This would continue in my existence of life as well as when I die. I'm no longer ever allowed to step foot in that bar again. That therefore is an eternal punishment. It's a non-stopping punishment that never has a chance of being rectified. That never has a chance of correcting its behavior and, and being allowed back in, being forgiven. So this eternal punishment doesn't necessarily mean an eternal tormenting the way I read these passages when it talks about the punishment. And in fact, in Jude 7, he expresses it as an undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So I'll say it to say this, to try to make it simple. I believe the fire is eternal, the fire being God's wrath, God's judgment. I believe it exists as much as God exists because it's part of God. It's one of God's natures. It's there eternally as an all-consuming flame that will always exist and never, ever stop burning. But those that are thrown into the lake of fire, which is now called the second death, I believe that they're extinguished. I believe that they cease to exist. They're burnt to a crisp. Um, and I'm using this figurative language, but they basically are receive their due punishment of no longer having an existence. The body has been destroyed in the first death. The soul is now destroyed in the second death and they no longer exist. That is an eternal punishment. It's not a perpetual ongoing torment that they feel, which I don't find the support for. And I know people use passages to talk about that where, you know, Jesus will mention um, something about uh, people being in torment. Um, I think if you look specifically at the parable of, or the story, whatever it is, of Abraham's bosom, Lazarus at the time is in Hades, which is different to the Greeks than Gehenna. Hades is kind of the place you go after the first death. I believe Gehenna is the place you go at the second death. So between that first and second death, Lazarus is in the Hades and he's being tormented. So there may be a season of torment, but I don't believe there's an eternity of torment that souls are suffering in anguish and pain. Um, and I'll admit, I hope that's the case because that sounds to me more like a just and merciful God than one that has them um, eternally suffering for a few short brief years in eternity of sin. Um, but anyway... I'll pause there and we can engage more because I feel like now I'm giving a sermon and I don't want to do that on your show. <laughs> well, no, I think you've you've actually mapped it out quite well. And full disclosure, uh, many years ago when I was in the ministry of the Worldwide Church of God, what you've just described is exactly what we believed. Uh, we drew the same conclusions based on those verses. So I, <coughs> excuse me, I actually applaud you for so clearly mapping out that belief, which I believe can be derived directly from the scriptures. My personal beliefs today have, have migrated from that position, but I think it's a, a legitimate position based on reading the verses and being open about what they actually say. Um, and so I think that's a great segue to go to our next commercial break and also to announce to the audience that, that uh, something or other publishing is in discussion with you, um, John, about the um, possibility of, of uh, anchoring and um, curating an anthology on this very topic and uh, of heaven and hell and the different perspectives on it and really unpacking this through a number of essays uh, from a variety of people 
so that people, so that readers can thoroughly review this and come to an enhanced understanding of perhaps what is really meant by heaven and hell. Uh, stay tuned when uh, when this ad ends. We'll be right back with more of uh, John Christie, and we'll bring uh, Dan Sanderson back into the studio to um, hammer this from yet another perspective. We'll be right back. The concept of heaven and hell has been a central idea throughout human thought and cultural history. From ancient civilizations to modern religions, people have explored the nature of the afterlife and the potential consequences of their actions during their lifetime. Royal Falcon Press Imprint presents a new project seeking diverse perspectives on the fundamental human theme of heaven and hell. Our goal is to create an anthology that provides readers with a rich and nuanced exploration of heaven and hell throughout human history, inviting writers to draw from a wide range of sources and authors, including religious texts such as the Bible and the Quran, philosophical treatises like Plato's Republic, and modern works like Neil Gaiman's The Sandman series or Michelle Baum's The Five People You Meet in Heaven. Scan the QR code to submit your contribution to Heaven and Hell at soupllc.com. Welcome back. I'm Wade Franson. We're on the Created in the Image of God show. We have, we're here with John Christie, uh, whose feature uh, documentary is available on Amazon.com, My Week in Atheism. And we've brought Dan Sanderson back into the studio to dig in a little bit deeper into this somewhat controversial topic that uh, a number of our audience members have been posting about, heaven and hell, the immortal soul. And Dan, you had a question right before the break that you posted in the chat. I don't understand annihilation. So yeah, I'll, like, uh, I'll let you and John cover that here. Yeah, so John, I mean, I was really anticipating the 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 explanation of, of annihilation, and I didn't quite, I mean, um, you very poetically uh, painted a, a, a nice picture, uh, you know, not you know good or bad or anything, but it was it was really good. But I didn't quite understand how how annihilation, you know, really wove all that together. I just wondering if you could come back to that. Sure, I think the most basic explanation would be that annihilation is the ceasing of existing. So I don't believe the soul is eternal. I believe that it can be ended. It can cease to exist. I think that's the point that Jesus makes about um, he who can destroy the body and the soul. So I think annihilationism is those that are not to use the easy term of saved, those that are not saved, those whose names are not in the book of life, will then be put into the lake of fire, which is the second death, which is the same place that the dragon, Satan, um, the beast goes into. It's not a place that he runs and rules and parties like the Far Side comics or anything like that. It's a place of existence being snuffed out, being burnt to a crisp, being an all-consuming fire that completely ends that existence. That would be to be annihilated, to be completely no longer existing in any form, consciousness, awareness of any sort. Does that yeah. explain that part for it? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I put, um, so, I mean, one thing that I think I can add to the conversation in terms of um, a clarification or a question that would go to people of faith is um, how do you feel um, about being able to reason after your uh, your lifely your your life on earth ends right so that that's what I'm curious about because um, I, I would imagine that as soon as the brain waves stop the 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 ability for daniel to to um to function or think really ceases um from that moment forward um what are what are your what are your thoughts and what what would you say that that um religious thinkers actually think in that case 
I'm going to have to go to my uh, profession, my, my career, to answer this because it's the way I see it. I'm a software consultant and um, specifically a solution architect. And I see it as more complex than one or the other, meaning this. Um, if you think of a computer and the parts, there's the hardware and there's the software. The hardware can operate without software. And without the hardware, the software needs an interpreter, right? So let me, so let me explain it this way. Um, the components of hardware in a computer being the RAM, the hard drive, they're all, in, in your expression, science. It's our brain, it's our physical matter. The metaphysical being the software, and it's coded instructions, it's coded reasoning, it's coded logic that the hardware operates under. So I'm not certain that the brain has its own capacity to reason in and of itself. I think it has the capacity to process reasoning so just as a computer would process the software's reasoning and all the key parts, it can't do that reasoning without RAM. It can't do that reasoning without ROM. It can't do that reasoning without hard drives. It can't do that. It needs a platform to reason under. But in and of itself, it's not creating the reason. So the, this, and this is the way I see it. I'm not stating this as this is the way it is. This is how it makes sense to me. The software is, in a sense, our immaterial. It's our metaphysical. It's our soul. Mm -hmm. The physical is the computer itself, the hard drive and all the, the hard components. And they're dependent upon that software. And I do believe that's why, you know, when we have things like the out-of-body out experiences or after-death experiences, they're separated from the body. And in those situations, the body is left in a lifeless or comatose state, whereas the metaphysical is still operating. And one of the things I've been fascinated by for several years is, are those life after death experiences and people that come back. And some of them are extremely compelling. I still don't know what I fully believe on them because some of it, it's too much, but um, some of them are extremely compelling cases. And that's where you I seem to see that activity is they leave the body but their awareness their consciousness is still in existence and i think that's the soul that can be destroyed does that help not really but um because because okay. <laughs> uh, yeah it's like we're, we're suspending multiple metaphors and uh it's yeah. it's somewhat helpful but um and i'm never trying to back somebody into a corner but i no, go right ahead. I, I, Back away. No, I mean, I'm. I'm. It's really an exploration. I really, I really don't understand how somebody comes to um, a realization of an afterlife. Um, and the, the, the well, well, soul Dan, is Dan, so. Let, let me, Dan. Let me jump in here and ask you. What is Dan Sanderson? What okay. Are what you? is? You just stole my Plato question I was going at. Oh, you're Dan, going Plato. Nice. I figured we had to, Dan. Well, yeah, I try and. <laughs> it's the forms, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. That's a favorite. That's a, that's a... I mean, we can we can look at a table and say, what is a table? Mm -hmm. You know, this is my basic version with the forms, and we can say, well, it's you know, four wooden legs and a top. Is that what a table is? So, what do you do with a table to make it a table? Well, you put paper on it and write. Okay, well, if I take this box and flip it upside down and put paper on it and write, does that now make it a table? Mm -hmm. Or if I put a if I put a, a tablecloth over it and put dinner plates on it, has it now become a table? What is a table, right? And you could do this with a pen. You could do this with everything. What's a chair? What's a? These are things that they have physical representation of a imperial, metaphysical, abstract form mm -hmm. or concept. And that's kind of what I'm seeing this as, the difference between the physical manifestation of it, again, to me, the computer, and the immaterial abstract form being our consciousness, our awareness. I don't believe that solely exists in our brains and in our you know, synapses and our electricity that's running through our body. I believe those are um, 
conduits for it, but those aren't those parts don't make up the whole. Yeah, so I feel like I'm being more poetic, and I no, no, but I love no the poetic. These are hard to explain. No, the poetic is actually it's a really good place to be. Um, I would, I mean, and and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to meet you where you're at, and I thank you for bringing and inviting Plato to the party. What I what I would say is that uh, go right for the top. Plato was 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 generous enough to place the forms in a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. with God at the top. I want to speak your language. God is at the top. It's the Greek form of good. It's yeah. right at the top. And underneath that is cultivated virtues. Okay. So we, when I'm not going to arrive at any sort of deep insight by, and thank you for the analogy of the software and the table, this type of thing. But the thing that really resonates is let's bring ethics into the equation. Let's bring noble being and into the equation, because this is ultimately where that trajectory of goodness is orientated towards. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm, if I'm going to have any redeeming qualities that are going to carry on after I perish of the, on this planet of this like earthly existence, it's going to be because I am in that shadow of goodness my children or people in my community are going to say, yeah, he was a good, he was a good man. Wade was a good man. Um, John was noble in his pursuits. And so he fits into this, into this um, ongoing software, which is essential to the human, into the, the definition of human. So you like imagine uh, a lecture on essences, that of which you take away um, eliminates that thing right i mean you 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 no longer have humanity if you have no ethics this this is kind of the underpinning of of plato's gift so where does that come from um essentially the meditation that i think most of uh academia and plato scholars miss completely is the emphasis on that ethics um aristotle you know he was he uh he was um a <clears throat> he wrote the book on ethics. <laughs> well, I mean, he did, but not not from this um, abstract gift. No, he was yeah, he was much more functional and prescriptive, and and that's kind of yeah. that's that's what Plato I feel is referring to as a fool is being kicked in the head. It's like you're not you're not getting the fact that I'm describing this as something very unique in the capacity of humans to think in an abstract form and then and then and then orient they orientate those those forms towards a projection of the good that's that's what you're missing you're missing that it's it's all ethics there's nothing else other than the ethics of this and this will change you and this is what makes us greek this was this orientation towards a perfected perfectibility is what changes now wade is brilliant in this and it's something that I resonate with him um, because and I think it's part of his his the the bigger matrix that he's uh, dialing into is that our religious experiences are revelatory they um, uh, generationally they're improving so one of the things earlier on where Wade brought this um, um, example from the scripture and i said no everybody agreed here like wade and and john both agreed i said no for a particular reason the particular reason is that everybody knows if they know me they know that i'm pro um hellenic um philosophy plato right but one of the things that is an incremental improvement in history on on the hellenic tradition is in fact what that scripture actually teaches us is that we don't hold our sons accountable for the sins of our fathers. And in ancient Greece, they did that. You were held accountable by your tribes. You were held accountable by your families. And with all of the ex excellence that came out of that time period, it's sitting right behind me. It's everywhere <laughs> around me. You, they miss that and the progressive nature of our society um, 
has moved us into a better place. Um, and that becomes self apparent to, uh, to, to anybody that can, can, can reason with it, right? Using your, your God given talent to reason, you can say, yes, that intuitively heartfelt makes sense that we are not holding my children and my children's children responsible for something that I did, especially if I was so reckless with my soul that I, um, I moved for the potholes. I, there's this idea of Edgar Allan Poe, Poe riding down the street, riding a bicycle, and he sees a pothole and he swerves towards it. You know, we don't we don't exist like that as most people. We we we're trying to actually move towards this good and become become better people. And um, so, you know, that's 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 the way I would see it. Um, yeah, so, comments from yeah, Wade I, I, or John. I, I don't. I don't. It's. Yeah, similar to, I know I'd said this with Wade, but again, I feel like you and I on this are closer than we are apart as well, um, because I agree with what you're saying. If I'm understanding you correctly, though, I may have a discrepancy with what is that good? So l let me ask you this, because you started with the brain and the physical matter of it. Specifically, do you believe in the good, whatever that may be, God, uh, immaterial essence of a target that we can aim towards of what is good. Oh yeah, absolutely. Do you, yeah. Do you believe that? Okay. Mm -hmm. So that the good to me, what Plato saw there, he was, I often say this about the Republic, the Republic painted a portrait of Christ. He just didn't know who it was. Yeah. And I, and I see that with the good. And I think exactly for that reason, that's why John starts his gospel with the logos, because that was, the God, that was the essence, that was the immaterial good, logic, all things that held everything together was the Logos. And John starts it out with saying in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God, and the Logos became flesh, and it's this guy Jesus that I'm going to tell you about now for 21 chapters. Um, John understood his audience. I think John was probably the most apologetic of the Gospels, meaning I think he was writing to a specific Greek audience. Mm -hmm. That's often why he has to interpret things, you know, which in Aramaic means X, Y, Z. Um, and I think he understood that in making it the logos that he was saying, you recognize this target that we've put on intelligence, good, logic, reason, essence of something the forms. Now let me tell you where that, who that is, who that form is. And so moving all the way to today, we've always attempted or tried to make society better by aiming towards a target. There's always a standard of what it may be. And I can make a lot of arguments that for the last 2000 years, that standard has been Judeo-Christian doctrine even through times of, you know, people blame our American civil, um, not civil war, but the slavery on the Bible, because the Bible condoned slavery, and that's where they got their power. Well, that's also the book that they held up to say this is not right, because the Bible um, speaks against it as well. And, the, and they said, you can't treat other men like this. We don't have to get into that. But my point being is, throughout history, human history, we've, at least for the last 2000 years, held up in the Western world, a banner of what that good is, what we can measure that by. And it always comes to some level of Christian ethics, Judeo-Christian ethics. Um, and we don't see them as just they exist. We see them as they were given to us by someone innately inside of us, an awareness. Wade talked about the Gentiles who in Romans um, didn't have the law, but they still upheld the law. That's that conscious. That's that innate giving of the law to us. And um, and I, I don't want to go long on, on this part to it, but enough to just say, so I see it as I'm in agreement with you from the standpoint of there's that good, there's that target we're aiming towards, reaching towards, that people can judge whether or not you're a good person by, we call that objective morality. And when I teach about objective morality, the one thing I try to make clear is objective morality is not a list of do's and don'ts from an objective source. 
objective morality is the fact that we can weigh. It's not the fact that we're weighing those items on a scale. It's the fact that there's a scale, that there is something that we can weigh on. And I think our ethics, morality, they're tied to value. And value takes, you know, a sentient being to value something. And mm. when something is valued by, some, by someone, that's where we derive our morality from. Um, I feel like I shouldn't have gone started going down that path. I know we're running no, out of time. No, it's, it, it, it's, it's really good. I, I, there's several points that I really can see that a Judeo-Christian tradition has um, uh, a superior stance over, over the, the Greek position that I seem to, that I, that I love. And I think um, my point is that just like uh, people misinterpret the literal aspect of um, the forms, I think that people um, misinterpret the little the literal aspect of as Jesus as the embodiment representation of the ideal person. Right. So I was saying where so from my perspective, I look at this and I say. And I can't, I'm not sure what Wade's word is on this, but it's like either revelatory or somewhere between a combination of revelatory and progressive, that history is moving us towards um, something like a higher moral arc, right? And so when we look at the Greek tradition and then we look at what the Judeo tradition um, uh, grew into and then how it grew into Christianity and, you know, where it's actually going now, I'm saying that when you, when when a when a Greek tries to understand the forms, and they try and reason with those four buckets of cardinal virtues, there's nothing intuitive about that. But you know what's amazingly intuitive is to feel like he's sitting right beside me and walking every day with me. That's intuitive. That I have a best friend that is with me no matter what that that intuitively changes and makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up because it's a and, and i'm not saying i'm saying this to be poetic and to be beautiful i just it's 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 my apologetic that there's a compatibility there that says that heuristic is more impactful and deep and meaningful in its in its truthful representation and to call a metaphor when a metaphor is a metaphor, to be truthful with that. That's where I'm at. And I'm saying, I, you know, like, and, and, I, and I find the misdirected, misinterpret, over-exaggerated representations to be exactly that. And I don't think we as a society do anybody any higher form of good by not being truthful and as direct as possible with the heuristic that makes us the best beings that we can be. Yeah. Be what it's making me think of is I just had a conversation and it was a converse, conversation, separate conversation about separate topic about something that someone was saying, in a YouTube, I think it was YouTube. Um, and the, the, the hard, the thing that frustrates me is people learn, number one, so many learn just based on what someone says without going into depth. You know, it's rote learning. I was taught this and so now I regurgitate it. And it seems to be those who can be the loud, loudest, the most hubris, the most vocal, the, you know, really animated, really convicting, firm in their belief direct that we say that's oops <laughs> that we say that's the truth that's the one i'm going to grab to i'm going to believe i think it's a combination of that and then it also sits well with us we we accept it um when we're not certain when we're again to my point about hell you know i'm not claiming that what i the way i described hell and my belief on annihilationism is absolutely true but it's what seems most reasonable to me at this time by the, by the data in scripture, as well as by my understanding of God. 
but I'm willing to change it. So I'm not going to come on here and say, this is the way it is and point my finger and be very direct and you can't believe otherwise. It's, it's crystal clear. The point, what I'm trying to make a point here is, so I think with a lot of our theology, we don't like it to be unsettled. We don't like it to be uncomfortable. It makes us uncomfortable because we're not certain and we like to be certain. We want to be certain. We want to know what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's evil. We want it all in a nice row. And that's how we've done this now for thousands of years throughout church history of setting everything up. And so we've set all these doctrines and these packages. What does it mean to be saved? How do you get saved? We use those words, saved, born again. Um, is salvation because you said a prayer and you said these specific words? And did you get baptized? And we have all these rules and all these things. And I think that we find comfort in those things mm. because we can then go off and have horrible behavior, but be able to point to someone and say, but at least I'm not them because I've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I said it as a prayer and I'm going to heaven and it, and it forgives all of our sin. I'm not trying to be patronizing, but you know, we, we play that game well, and we want those certainties. Yeah. So, and, and, and my only point to, I'll, I'll wrap this up and let you go away, but my only point to that, to wrapping this around to what you were saying, Daniel, is I think what you're expressing is more of a uncertainty of things, not, not following the Orthodox Christian doctrine on certain on things, but you're feeling that, but I recognize it, you know, in, in expression of the good or whatever. And my question is always, is that enough to be saved? Because when I look at the thief on the cross, when he was up there with Jesus, he didn't get baptized. He didn't say, will you be my Lord and savior? He didn't say anything. He didn't say, forgive me of my sins. He didn't say a sinner's prayer. He didn't say anything that we're supposed to do. He just said, Hey, will you remember me? And Jesus said, trust me, you'll be with me in paradise. You acknowledged something about me that I want my creation to acknowledge that I have the power, whatever that is of being God. And that was all it took. And he saved. So formulas and, and doctrine um, never sit well with me because I feel like those are the most dogmatic um, in all honesty, probably know the least at times. Sorry, Wade, you can. No, that, that's on. great. I, I've just really enjoyed the chance to sit back and listen to this. I think there's a lot of depth here. Um, I, I want to try to probably oversimplify and show less depth than you guys as I now move towards uh, landing this plane. I'll ask a question first, and I'm going to post a scripture in the chat, which I'll sort of use to summarize my position. Um, the question is, is not this whole concept of being saved the biggest formula of all, the most formulaic of formulaic ideas? Because personally, I don't believe that 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 idea is accurate or genuine in the Bible, that of being saved, right? Yeah. Um, I think it's a it's a it's a continuum. My personal belief is, well, I'll, I'll now post the scripture and share it. Um, it's Hebrews eleven verse six. Without faith, it is impossible to please him because, right? You have to have faith to be saved, and do you have the faith to be saved? Right. Well, this is this is a better, in my opinion, summary of what it means to be saved. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. It's really about pleasing God not whether or not you're saved for, you know, it's, it's drawing the favor of the father. Cain killed Abel because he did not have God's favor. He did not have God's grace. He did not please God as much as Abel pleased God. Abel pleased God more than Cain pleased God and Cain's jealousy then led to him killing Abel. Cain was farther away from God than Abel was. I recently shared with a friend um, nobody is as close to God as they think they are, and nobody is as far away from God as they think they are, right? Um, if you think you're close to God, you're not as close as you think you are. If you think you're far away from God, you're not as far away as you think you are. Adam and Eve were not as far away from God as they thought they were when they hid from him. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, 
whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So the sin that Adam and Eve committed was to not recognize the grace and favor of God, to not recognize the beauty of the garden, to not recognize that the path to every blessing and every bit of goodness, to use Dan's analogy, was to listen to God and to follow his advice, his fatherly advice, his guidance, to, to, to stay away from that tree. You're not ready for those car keys yet. You know, you grab those car keys, you go out in the winter, you go to the bar, it's not going to end well. <laughs> you don't yet have the experience. You're rushing into this. You have yeah. a lifetime ahead of you. It's that it's like that Cat Stevens song, Father and Son, if you know that so song, um, some of the lines in that. Um, so it's it's really this simple. You believe that God is and that that he's really trying to help you. You know, I, I sometimes am frustrated in dealing with my 15-year-old daughter and my 12-year-old son. They're at that age where they don't trust that I'm doing this for their own good. They think I'm being in brute ogre. And, you know, maybe I'm being a little bit too strict. Maybe I'm being a little bit too protective. Um, but the but the alternative of them just rebelling and going the other direction, you know, go for it. But there's a school of hard knocks there. Um, yeah. So... To me, heaven is simply nearness to God. Hell is separation from God. Whether it's actual annihilation or extinction, I don't actually believe it is now these days. Um, it's a continuum, and it's not a binary situation. And I think my understanding of the Bible is a progression. You, and and it, and I'll come back to this wonderful analogy you gave about the hardware and the software that you you unpacked it so beautifully and i think it did explain annihilation but i think there's one more component and that is the logos itself what distinguishes us from the animals is language and even though the dolphins have you know evolved to the point where they can have names for each other they really do it's proven um you know two clicks and a whistle is this dolphin one click and two whistles is that dolphin right and they know this about themselves they have rudimentary language. Bees have rudimentary language. They can do dance and tell people where the pollen is. But the, the depth of our understanding, the word, the logos that we have within our software, and this is proven scientifically by people who learn multiple languages. Multiple languages expand the capacity of that software. And even the hardware is more fully utilized when we learn multiple languages. And if you learn them well, your IQ even goes up. You're able to grasp concepts that you were not able to grasp. And the one way to improve the IQ is to learn another language. And so it's that gift of God, the logos, that allows us to have these kinds of discussions and, co and converse with one another. And um, the more we talk about God, the more we explore his word, the more I ask Dan what he thinks about it and you what you think about it and then listen to each other. Um, the more our mind and our comprehension is expanded about who and what God is, but we will always forever be seekers. We will never come to understand God fully, but we can understand God a lot more than the people in Adam's time or Noah's time or Abraham's time, especially if we dig into the richness of those writings and how it unpacks and unfolds. And as our grasp of logos and words and language increases, we can develop new and more expanded concepts that help us to toss out the old antiquated concepts. Even that concept of whether you're saved or not as the ultimate formula, because what we end up doing is we then wash our hands with a fist. The worst application of that formula is when we use it to judge others. And we always, to your point, will elevate ourselves. At least I'm not as bad as that person over there. And if, if all else fails, then we're obviously worse, far worse than that other person. Well, yeah, but I've accepted Jesus. And therefore, I'm going to heaven and that person's going to hell. I mean, to me, that's utterly ridiculous. That is insanely ridiculous. <laughs> Um, but I understand how we get there as we build concept upon, con upon concept um, based on 
really a messenger that came with a specific message primarily to the Jews of his day, the Pharisees and Sadducees, and then pivoted it to an outward looking approach that said the two commandments are love God and love your fellow man. And opening up, quote, salvation, unquote, to all Gentiles, right? Um, and um, I would say by extension, it does open up salvation to people who never heard about Jesus. One of the problems that I always had, you know, was, okay, well, what's going to happen to all those people who lived before Jesus? They didn't know about Jesus. Could any of them be saved, right? And what about the people that lived in 30 AD in India? And, and you know, Jesus was here and everyone that knew Jesus or what about the people that even lived 200 miles away in 60 AD and died in 60 AD and Jesus was on earth, but they hadn't heard of him yet. I mean, something so ridiculous as to whether you or not you had heard the name of Jesus would determine whether or not you could, you would be annihilated. It makes right. utterly no sense to me. Um, and I get, I get how people sort of box themselves into this framework and this idea Um but I don't want to get into theology, but um, I, now I'm kind of rambling. Um, having having no, but you're making you're making the point. I mean, it's in that scripture that you pulled, the Hebrews eleven six. You know, that was a perfect selection because again, that basically is the thief on the cross. He didn't say the prayer. He didn't have all the other ducks in a row. He just believed that God existed. It was he was right next to him. And that he would reward him for seeking him. And all he did was say, remember me. Yep. And that was it. You know, and I think we're a little, again, I think we like the loud, boisterous hellfire and brimstone. This is the way it's got to be. These are the specifics because we're uncomfortable with, with it being more fluid. You know, and this was Jesus's point with the Sermon on the Mount. You had the Ten Commandments, well, you had one commandment in the garden. Then you had 10 commandments at the mountain. And then that turned into 611 or 613 13, Levitical yeah. laws. And he said, and I'm going to add more to that. You started out the, the discussion tonight with, you know, even if you lust after a woman, you've committed adultery. I'm going to make it even harder for you. It's what comes out of your heart that matters. Mm -hmm. And that's what this really gets down to is where is your heart? If your heart desires God, you will have him. I don't know that you have to do the specific patterns and the formulas. I'm going to leave that between you and God. I know if my kids approached me with desire and love, but they didn't do it quite the right way, I'm still giving them my, <laughs> my love. I'm returning it. I'm what? not going to say sorry. And let me let me bring back in something you said at the very beginning when you were here with Dan, you know, that you, that you realized you were wrong, right? Well, what I realized when I was in Leningrad in uh, 1993, I believe it was, during Gorbachev's abduction. And I was, um, I've told this story before, but I was meeting with some, there were some people from our global denomination that were working with Radio TV in Leningrad on bringing in Western oriented programming. And we were, we were bringing in religious ideas behind the Iron Curtain. I personally was the, um, um, the, the um, director of a, a religious festival with 180 people in Poland. Um, before the Iron Curtain came down, it was an illegal gathering of 180 people to celebrate God and worship God for eight days. That was wink, wink, nod, nod, allowed by Pol Orbis, the government tourist agency, because we were bringing Western, Western Valuta. So I was active behind the Iron Curtain in those days. And lo and behold, now I end up in Leningrad when Gorbachev was abducted. And I'm coming in from Finland and the streets are deserted. And this was pre-internet. I didn't, and pre-cell phone, I didn't know tanks were coming in from Moscow. <laughs> as I was coming in from Finland and um, it was the weirdest thing. And, the, and those Soviets laid down their arms because they said, yeah, we're not doing this again. We're not going to open fire on, on our, on our own people. And then Yeltsin took power and the coup ended. But in that moment, there was such heightened excitement in Russia. And I was with these young Western oriented um, people, young men working at the radio TV in Leningrad, and they were passionately talking about how in this crisis, the satellite nations will return to Mother Russia, right? 
And I'm like, no, they won't. These people have such a deep hatred. And I'd been in Latvia and Estonia and Lithuania and they were, you know, and I, and I had studied Russian in order to be doing all this stuff. And the Poles, they all hated the Russians with a deep, deep, deep passion. I mean, we see how this playing out in Ukraine today. Even today, right, there's still that that hatred and that willingness to to fight beyond what Russia could have imagined um, to not succumb to Mother Russia again. And, and I, the point is, I thought, how on earth could these young, intelligent, Western-oriented, fluently bilingual people not know that, no, the satellites won't come and rejoin Mother Russia in her time of crisis? And it clicked we all think we're right. Whatever it is we believe, we all think we're right. We're all convinced we're right. Every single one of us on this planet, to your point about the comfort of knowing that we have the answer, that we're following the formula, we think and we know that we've got it right. And that's the beauty of repentance, right? That belief, that awareness that no, I'm not right. I'm, I'm wrong half the time, or maybe more than half the time I'm wrong. So I'm not going to go around thinking I'm right all the time, or I've got it all right. I'm going to have an aspect of humility. I'm going to have the mind of Christ in me that esteems others better than myself. I might learn something from this other person, even if I think I own the magic formula. And in our denomination, we used to think we had the truth. We had the truth, right? We were we were we knew that you had to be open minded to learn the truth to learn our teachings to learn our doctrines you had to be open minded so we looked for open minded people and then once they accepted our doctrines we wanted them to be closed minded and it reminds me of what jesus said about the pharisees you scour heaven and earth to make one disciple and then you make them twofold the son of hell as yourself and it is this closing of this mind this almost rabid belief that you have the answers and that you've got it right. And so, yes, repentance means recognizing not only that I was wrong and that I did wrong, but I have this lower nature and it leads me to constantly come up with the wrong thoughts and the wrong ideas. And we see it in spades with our teenagers as they're exploring and they have not yet exercised their senses to discern good and evil because they've just followed the rules good kids follow the rules on up to age you know 8 10 12 and then suddenly they're like wait a minute i don't have what i don't have to do what dad says their friends are like i don't do what my dad says well i'm not going to do what my dad says yeah go out you know have fun and now they're exercising yeah. their senses to discern good and evil during that phase of rebellion and hopefully they will you know, perform the way that uh, that that nice joke about, you know, when the when the son goes off to college and then he comes back from college and he says, man, I, I can't believe my dad learned so much in the four years I was gone. <laughs> yeah. You know, as they come to the awareness that they don't know everything after all. Yeah. And that that brings that it down true. to a real sort of, you know, more more physical level versus some of the theology driven ideas that Christianity has derived from the New Testament versus perhaps the more practical, simple ideas of the Old yeah. Testament. Because Jesus was a Jew. He followed the Jewish laws. He didn't he didn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. He, um, you know, kept many of the principles. He just elevated them, transformed them to a higher level. What's that? What's that verse? You know, the law shall be written on your heart. Right. Yep. It's not that you're following it out of rope, but it's written on your inward parts. That's right. And I'll stop yeah, there because I've held forth for quite a few minutes here. No, that's that's good, though. And, you know, I know I've said this to you before, and I'll say it for the recording as well. But, you know, I hold to, um, I believe it's Anselm of Canterbury that said, you know, in the essentials, we have unity. In the non-essentials, we give liberty and in all things, charity. And those Love essentials that. to me That's are beautiful. small. Yeah. You know, they, they maybe fit on, you know, one hand, maybe less, maybe a couple fingers. But um, Well, Jesus said too, that, love God and love your, <laughs> love your neighbor as yourself. Well, right, right. And I mean, it's, it's really, you know, to me, 
if you want to go by the label of, of Christian, believing that Jesus Christ is God is, is an, is an essential, um, you know, and, and believing that, that it's through him, we have salvation. That's again, to label yourself as a Christian, um, the thief on the cross in the way that he recognized that was, was by just spotting the power that Jesus had next to him. And again, to those that have never heard the name of Jesus Christ, I don't think they're going to be held to a name. I think it's again, a recognition of the eternal creator, God. Um, and, and again, outside of the essentials, you know, hell and what, where we're going to be in the end times is not that we're going to figure it out. It'll happen. And someday we'll know, but, um, that's not an essential, you know, and, and there's so many things when I hear people talk about, um, doctrines and dogmas and we get so wrapped up in these again, and we try to have people fit into a box and a formula. And, and I think it's so that we feel comfortable so that we feel safe. And, um, my, my first book here, the way. people of the sign, um, in our former fellowship, we believed that we were the super Christians because mm. we had the law and the testimony of Christ. We had the seventh day Sabbath, but we were superior to the seventh day Adventists because we also kept the annual Sabbath. We kept the yeah. Jewish holy days and the seventh day Sabbath, um, yeah. the annual Sabbath and the weekly Sabbath. And that was the sign, right? The sign between Israel and God was the seventh day Sabbath that is clearly brought out in uh, in the Ten Commandments and also in uh, Exodus 16, where they had to go out and collect the manna and God reinforced mm -hmm. the Sabbath because on the seventh day there was no manna and they collected, you know, you know the story. Uh, the point is that was the sign uh, that God gave when he said, um, you know, by this, you know me as the creator and I know you as my people, that you rest mm -hmm. on the seventh day and that you observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. But the sign and, 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 and the reason I wrote this book was at the end of it, I began the journey of realizing that was never the sign that Jesus gave. It was never the sign of a Christian. And I identified this verse as the sign of a true Christian, because this is that objective, outside, independent, third party observer being able to view it. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have loved one for another. And this whole idea of casting each other into hell is a Christian idea. And so how yeah. on earth can any outside, independent, third party observer believe that Christians are disciples of Christ when they're casting each other into hell. It's ludicrous. And this is what I came to realize as I then set off on a search for 10 years and in a spiritual dead end to find who are the true disciples of Christ? Who are the people that really exemplify love? Not to the degree that we pat each other on the back and preach to the choir about how we have love in our tribe while we hate everybody who's not in our tribe. You know, Jesus said, why, why do you claim to love God whom you've not seen and you don't love your neighbor whom you have seen? And he didn't say your neighbor's a Christian, right? But we don't even love our fellow Christians if they're of a different denomination because they're going to hell and we're not. So <laughs> this to me is the outside independent objective measure of who is saved, right? Who is going to heaven. Not that I believe in either of those things in the sense of the way they're characterized by standard Christian theology, um, but rather uh, our understanding of that can evolve to broaden and encompass all of humanity. And um, this is, yeah, this, this, you're right. And this is the point I was trying to make, you know, to Dan earlier about people gravitating towards the, the the loudest and the ones that are the most dogmatic because it makes us feel comfortable. We don't have to go do the research. We don't have to wrestle this belief or this passage ourselves because this guy wrapped it up in a nice authoritative package and gave it to me. And now I can judge others and I can judge myself and say, they're not saved. I'm saved and go through that. And I find in my dealing with atheists and I still deal, you know, talk to a lot of atheists on a regular basis, um, one way or another through email, through conversations and, and my podcast even. And, um, what I find that I'm more 
wrestling against with them is trying to unwrap and unpackage doctrines that they've been taught in the church. Most of them do have knowledge. Um, most of them did come from Christian backgrounds or some offshoot, at least. Um, very rare that I'll, I'll deal with someone who is a complete atheist from day one, you know, birth or something. Um, and I'm always trying to unpack beliefs because they'll say, you know, it all, it, there's just so many misguided things that we've imposed on the Bible that we've, right. again, when we go look up what is eternal punishment, we don't have a passage that says a place where they will burn eternally and suffer without right. ceasing right. forever. But yet that's what we believe. Yep. But there isn't that passage. And, and Jesus didn't teach that. And that's the main point. It is not what Jesus was trying to say. It was not actually how Jesus was representing God. Because if he right. was, then how could you believe this about God? How could you believe that God rewards those who seek him if he's a if he's simply a vengeful God that's looking to cast anyone into hell mm -hmm. that doesn't worship him, right? So it is the hypocrisy of Christians often that leads to people embracing atheism. It is the way that Christians teach uh, treat others and not just Christians, but followers of any religion, followers of Islam, followers of Judaism, followers of Hinduism, you know, that, that profess to be followers of those belief systems, but whose actions don't match um, an understanding of what is actually being taught. Yeah, and I don't want to slip into the same sin I'm accusing them of and start condemning people. But but enough to say this. Um, I have friends, family members, you know, people that are very hard-lined. I mean, even to the point of, you know, what translation of the Bible you're going right. to use that scripture from. <laughs> and, um, and they're very hard-lined on these things. And, you know, I want to just give grace to them as yeah. I would to anyone else. Um, and, and an understanding of, I think, more times than not, Personally, I feel it comes from a area of insecurity, again, because they need to feel secure in their salvation. And the way that they do that is by having clear, drawn lines on things to be able to say, I'm on this side, you're on that side, therefore, I'm safe. No, we're, we're, we're on team God, right? And absolutely, I agree with you 100%. I hope I haven't offended anyone here. This show is actually designed for people like that, people who, t who tremble at the word of God, people who are God fearing people. I am not here to make light of anyone's belief and sub in and or submission to God based on their understanding of it. But in but a, but a minister and I'm not a minister, I resigned from the minister. But if if we want to minister to people, then we should follow the teaching that says that are that the job of a minister is to in meekness instruct those who oppose themselves yeah. who are trapped by their own frankly superstitions um there's a there's a verse in the baha'i faith um i know there are a number of people watching this on the uh, clearwater baha'i channel um the verse is um uh, that the people are wandering in the paths of delusion bereft of discernment to see God with their own eyes, to hear his melodies with their own ears. Thus have we found them. Thus have their superstitions become veils between them and their own hearts. And I love that formulation because these superstitions become veils between us and our own hearts. Our own heart would even tell us God is not a vengeful God seeking to cast us into hell. You know, and Jesus reveals that, you know, I, I love how the story of Cain and Abel is flipped in the Gospels in the story of the prodigal son. In the story of the prodigal son, Cain is the hero and Abel is the bad guy, right? Abel is the son who stayed with the father and, you know, pleased the father and the 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 son that left is Cain. He didn't please the father. He took his inheritance. He left. He spent it on wine, women, and song. He ended up sleeping in a pigsty and saying, you know what? Um, even the 
even the servants in my father's household have it better than me. I will go back and beg my father to take me in as a servant. And then God, the, you know, the parable is that he runs, he sees the son afar off and he runs out and throws the mantle and slaughters the fatted calf and throws a big party for him. And the, and the faithful son gets upset and says, what? I've been serving you and you didn't throw a party for me. You didn't kill the fatted calf for me. And he looks at him and says, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. And he, and he chastises the son for being jealous of his brother. You see how he flips the script on the Cain and Abel story in this, in this instance to show that, no, it's not a formula in that way. And God isn't the way you thought based on the one story that revealed one aspect of God's character. Yeah. I'm glad you took it there, Wade, because... Um... It, as I was listening to the um, all of the uh, humility prompting, which is I I, I absolutely get that I, I get that um, you you have to approach your uh, confidence with um, humility and turn your hubris in that direction in 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 a way that's um, humble. However, I think there is a there's something god given and this is our ability to reason and so one thing to add to both of your perspectives as you start to fill that out for the audience is to say you still have to trust your ability to detect irony and contradiction and that's the alert that wade says wait a minute that's not i'm not saying i have the end wade's not saying he has the answer he's saying the one plus one is not equaling two. And that's what John's, this is what's revealing when John reads the scripture. He's saying, there's something about this that doesn't sit well. And are we doing God's work? Yes, we are. Because this is a natural given talent for us to be able to, this is our reasoning faculty, right? This is our ability to look at it. And I'm not, and you have to be able to distinguish to say, I'm not saying that this is the the orthodox truth and this is the way things are, and I'm not taking anything away from the picture that Wade's trying to say that people want to see themselves as being right. But what I'm saying is I'm like, I see this contradiction, I see this contradiction over here, and I see this contradiction over here. Help me fill in the gaps. And when when the gaps don't get filled in and they get, then I'm still there sitting there as the student in front of the teacher, humble in front of the teacher saying, please tell me again for the thousandth time why this doesn't work this way or why is there this irony or why is this contradiction glaring at me right in the face? And I think that's what we also have to recognize as a counterpoint to you know, approach this certainty with humility and everything else. We also need to understand that we are magnificent beings of supercomputers to return to your analogy of a, of a you know of a computer you know we're all amazing detection we have this amazing detection mechanism to be able to say no that that doesn't that's not right that's something's wrong there so that's what i, I would say like um, and and now that we've solved all the problems of theology and philosophy <clears throat> But it's um, not, we're missing it though, Wade. We didn't solve it. We're I, saying we brought I'm up being the sarcastic. That was sarcasm. That was irony. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't think, I don't think we've solved anything. But um, hopefully we have opened up, opened up the bottle of wine, if you will, of, of thought and let it breathe a little bit. And um, the one thing we haven't solved is who are we going to give a book to, right? There were a number of... Um, number of uh, quotes here uh, that uh, I'm going to share this one here from from John Goodman or Goodman Brown, not John Goodman, sorry. Um, <laughs> going way back to the beginning of the show, the fruit is the first feeling of anger towards your mother as a child. Emotional Eve woman got us to identify with our feeling. Children naturally forgive until they're fatigued by their parents. <laughs> well, that's that verse, right? Of fathers provoke not your children to anger mm -hmm. um 
that's an interesting uh, contribution from Goodman Brown. Here's one from one of our Baha'i friends. Out of the whole world, he hath chosen for himself the hearts of men, hearts which the host of revelation and of utterance can subdue. Um, from the writings of Baha'u'llah. Um, well, here's one way to, I mean, we all know Cameron, but let me throw this one up. We could put it in trust for his um, his seventh generation born. We could put the book into some sort of time capsule. <laughs> well, I, 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 I <laughs> yeah, if, if you're going to visit the sins, what about the rewards, right? Um, no, wait, where was that one? That was a different one from Cameron. Um, let me find that one. I wanted to put it back up for a little longer here. I, I was actually reading this and contemplating bringing it in. It didn't find the right moment. But that's, again, that's the yin yang of that statement that the soul that sins, it shall die. And I don't visit the sins of the fathers upon the children. And then God contradicts himself, it seems, by saying he will visit the sins of the fathers down to the seventh generation. It's like that proverb, um, that famous proverb about um, don't answer a fool according to his folly. Yep. And then two verses later, answer a fool according to his folly. Right. And, uh, you know, you have to know. But that's, but that's wonderful because that's what Dan was talking about, about having the discernment is God expects us to get to a point. And that's the beauty of, of that proverb is it's a contradiction, but it's not. Because on one hand, it's saying if you answer every fool according to his folly, you're going to make him look or make him think he's wise. So sometimes you just need to walk away and ignore him. But if you don't answer a fool according to his folly, then he's going to go on continuing thinking he was wise because he got one over on everybody. Different, and you need different to types of fools, different situations, depending on the yes, audience. Circumstances. That's right. And, and that's that discernment. Yeah. Right. Um, on and this one, and, and, I just wanted to make the comment that I think this is talking about a slightly different thing. Right. So. Mm -hmm. God and man should not visit the sins of the father on the children. But I think this is talking about natural consequences, right? This gets mm -hmm. to the nature and nurture mm -hmm. thing. There was some, uh, you know, Fwad, uh brought up epigenetics, right? And there is this theory that um, epigenetic triggers the genes that we carry and expresses them. He asks if we really have fr free will. Um, he says that um, we know from, or Cameron said, we know from epigenetics that trauma, et cetera, goes on for generations. And again, I think there is some truth to this. There is some proof to this. I would recommend anyone looking into this topic to, to read Bruce Lipton's Biology of Belief. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but um, seminal work that talks about what the DNA does versus the RNA. And um, how the RNA can reach out beyond the semi-permeable cell wall of the single cell organism to interpret the environment and to determine the environment. And based on what it reads in the environment, then it tells the DNA what to do, what copies to make and so on. And this is a great little single cell metaphor for the nature versus nurture debate, right? And how it's not one or the other, but it's both. And there is some component that even without nurture carries on. And then there's some component that nurture influences, but can't totally overcome nature. And it's a balancing act. And again, it plays out. I don't think there's any specific single way in which this plays out in all circumstances, in all people. There are all kinds of studies that have been done about, um, you know, what happens after multiple generations. I remember this one study I read about this group of people in Sweden and because it was an isolated area they and they had good records, they were really able to tell where this famine hit and then how that affected multiple generations based mm -hmm. on what had happened to the one generation. Um, and I think that's what this is speaking to about seven generations is that the nature nurture combination especially at, at, at scale, right? Something like American slavery, it definitely has implications and impacts that go on for generations, right? Both good and bad. It does go on, it does carry forward over generations, but legally in terms of law and justice, you do not hold the children, to your point, Dan, accountable for the sins of the parents. You don't hold them legally and morally accountable, but there are repercussions that go on beyond the generation that's committing the sin and or doing the good thing, right? Generational wealth uh, that can be 
accumulated through good things and not always, you know, today it seems like anyone who's wealthy must be evil. Um, you know, I understand where that attitude comes from, but it's divorced from reality, right? You know, doing doing good things and working hard, these are these are ways in, in which to accumulate wealth over time. You know, you can get rich slowly by consistently making it a goal of, of, of obtaining wealth. And there's nothing wrong with that, especially if your desire is to give your children a better life and therefore mm -hmm. your children will grow up privileged. And uh, if you do have some degree of wealth, like I've managed to accumulate a little bit over my lifetime, my children have way, way, way more than I had at their age. And I struggle every day with trying to fight against them being privileged in the negative sense, something we used to call spoiled, right? Um, but yeah, so you have this yin and yang of no, you don't, the, ch the children, the soul that sins, it shall die. The, ch the child shouldn't be held accountable for the father's sin. But yes, sin does carry on over multiple generations. I think your point to the repercussions of them is is the key there. The repercussions of sins do follow on. And you see that even in God's judgment of Israel, bringing in um, the Babylonians and the Assyrians. You know, that was after decades, generations of unfaithfulness, of waywardness, of, you know, that he finally said, you've been warned over generations. In a sense, the sins from your parents, the idolatry and things have been carried through generations. And now it's time for judgment. But that doesn't mean that one way or the other, the sins of your father can, to use the, the easy terms we've been trying to explain and get away from, the <laughs> sins of your father will send you to hell or the good deeds of your father will send you to heaven. It's, that's not the area God's using that judgment. Absolutely. Um, here's another one, one that we played, showed earlier from Jet4231 regarding original sin. Um, you know, I'm leaning towards this one out of all the comments. Um, I think it is something that we looked into at the time and used it to further to this, the discussion. Um, but I don't know if, if any of either of you feel like somebody else had a more worthy comment here. I like this one because like you said, it kind of sparked discussion and yeah. back and forth about it. Yep. I, I think so too. And you guys, um, had there was a seed of not disagreement but of different differing perspective on, on interpretation and i think that's a really good one to spur uh some further um learning reading and an anthology right mm -hmm. yeah yeah and you used a one plus one equaling two earlier i believe wade and that's the way i look at a lot <laughs> that was of dan is, or dan did but yeah dan may say one plus one equals two and i may say yeah i don't really agree with that actually it's five minus three equals two and wade is saying actually it's two times one equals two and we're all kind of saying the same thing we're just we're formulating it a little bit differently yeah the story of the blind man and the elephant right or oh, yeah, or my, my more thing. favorite version is from life of brian dare i say that i watched it when he's uh when he's running from the crowd and he his sandal falls off and someone hoists the sandal and says, it's the sandal, it's the sandal. And he throws his gourd to someone so he can run faster. And they say, it's the gourd, it's the gourd. And now the sandal sect is fighting with the gourd sect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was interesting. I really like that response you gave, John. It's like, and I thought to myself, the, the fastest way to grace is to just to be graceful. And uh, that, mm. that was a nice thing to say. Did I say that the fastest way to grace? No, to I graceful. said it, but you're, you're, oh, okay. you know, your one plus one <laughs> is two and you're, you know, you know, yeah. your, um, your numbers. That's, that's right. We're all, we're, we're all talking, we're all talking in twos. I love that quote though. I will use that and credit you. The fastest way to grace <laughs> no, is to no, be no, graceful. I can't, that's I can't wonderful. accept, I can't, I can't accept that. You, you, uh, <laughs> that's all you. Inspired it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, we've yeah. now, uh, Asked Jet to get in touch with us and uh, Congratulations, claim his Jet. copy of the book. Um, all we have left to do, since I'm not going to air the uh, fourth ad, sorry to that sponsor, next time maybe we just couldn't tear away from this riveting discussion. However, I do have to share uh, what our audience can expect next week. 
at this same time, same place, um, Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Central Time, where we will return with Keith McGilligan. And his topic is All Scripture Has a Journey. Keith will ask the questions, how did the Bible become the Bible? What is the basis of its composition? Who is its author? What is a testament? And why are there two? How, do we, how did we get the English version of the Bible? Uh, Keith McGilligan is an author who's written a book on this topic. He's a fascinating uh, conversationalist which, with a unique approach to this, uh, a very practical, um, practical um, approach to it. And um, he will address a host of questions about the composition, the history, the heroes who helped along the way, and the price that was paid to bring with us. And now for those who are faithful, um, there is that barcode. <laughs> Thank you to Dan for scrambling and creating that. Um, we almost forgot to um, honor and reward John Christie by watching his video. It's only 99 cents. Um, and um, we would encourage you to do so. It's a really fascinating discussion. And John, I would love, love, love to have you back and not necessarily wait um, almost a whole year <laughs> to have you back again. Um, and perhaps next time we can um, invite a couple of other contributors to talk more deeply about heaven and hell and really drive the creation of this anthology. Because I think an anthology representing all these different perspectives of, of heaven and hell could um, not only be uh, really powerful in helping people you know, question a little bit their magic formula version of it and uh, maybe help people draw a little bit closer to God by being a little bit less judgmental of other people, right? Because again, um, it is said, why do you claim to love God whom you've not seen when you don't like love your brother whom you have? And this attitude of, I mean, the book, the whole book of Matthew really has judgment at its core. Um, you, you mentioned John being the most apologetic. Um, I think of Matthew as really getting into this talk, topic of judgment, judge not, lest you be judged by the same manner of judgment um, as you issue. That's how you're going to be judged. And then later in, in Matthew 25, talking about the judgment of the whole world, when the Son of Man returns in his glory, he will judge the nations and all their peoples. So um, this topic of judgment as we apply this idea of heaven and hell is really an important one in my opinion. Um, so anyway, I will um, stop there. We have gone on for a long time and um, just thank you again, John, and say we will have you back soon um, if you're willing. And Dan, thank you as yeah, well. Absolutely. Any yeah. final words that you'd like to share or leave the audience with before we sign off? Um, if you want to get in touch with me, you can go to johnchristie.com. Um, and that's pretty much about it. I look forward to coming back again. Enjoyed talking with both of you. This was great. Is that one word? Thank you. Um, johnchristie.com? Yeah, J-O-H-N-C-H-R-I-S-T-Y. Yep. We'll just show y. that right there. there Is that go. right? Yep, awesome. Perfect. That's how you get in touch with John. Feel free to do so directly. John, uh, John is uh, a podcaster in his own right, and um, you should uh, perhaps tune in there as well. Uh, Dan, any final thoughts? Nope. I enjoyed the conversation and look forward to writing an entry into Heaven and Hell and getting an anthology going. So, Look forward to reading it. And I still have to uh, come up with, you know, the closing tagline um, that I can, I, I always ramble into the end here. And uh, I'll just say, see you all next week. And I end it there. Bye now. <laughs>